All right, let's explore economies of scale and production, looking at Cobb Douglas production functions. And by doing this, we're going to learn a little trick so that you can tell whether a Cobb Douglas production function has increasing, decreasing, or constant returns to scale. So let's dive in. So let's suppose just to start, we had this production function Q equals L to the point two times K to the point four. And again, when we graph these, we're always going to put L on the x-axis and K on the y-axis. Let's check this function to see if it has economies of scale. Let's go through the formal definition here, and then we'll check. So economies of scale definition is when we multiply our inputs by some number greater than 1. So we could multiply all of our inputs by 2 or 3 or 4. Let's just say 2 for right now. So when our inputs double, we want to know what happens to our output. Does our output also double? If so, we have constant returns to scale. Does our output more than double? If so, that's increasing returns to scale, also called economies of scale. Or if we double all of our inputs and our output less than doubles, then we have diseconomies of scale. Or decreasing returns to scale. Now the mathematical definition is usually written something like this. If we multiply all of our inputs, again not just one, but all of our inputs by some number, lambda, and lambda is greater than one, we want to see Q, our output. What happens to that? So we multiply all our outputs by lambda, say two, then our output's going to go up by some other multiple phi. We want to look at the relationship between how much we're increasing our inputs and compare that to how much our output increases. When we multiply our inputs by a certain number bigger than one, what happens to our output? If phi is greater than lambda, or phi as a lot of people will pronounce this, if phi is greater than lambda, phi greater than lambda, we have increasing returns to scale. That just means the amount we multiply our output by is greater than the amount we multiplied our inputs by. That's the definition of increasing returns to scale. Now to check this, there's a lot of different ways, but let's start off simply and let's move a little more complicated as we go. All we want to do is start with some point and then multiply our inputs by some constant greater than one and then see what happens to output. So let me just pick a number here. Let's say, 15 laborers and 10 capital can be any number that we're checking here. So if we look at our legend here for our ISO quants, this point where we're using 15 workers and 10 machines is close to this purple one, not quite on the purple one. And the purple, I think, is this one for about four and a half units of output. Let's double check. Let's plug it into our production function and see what we get. So if we plug in L is 15 raised to the 0.2 power and then times 10 raised to the 0.4 power. We put that in our calculators. I'm getting about 4.3, a little bit bigger than 4.3. So 4.317 is our output. And that checks out a little bit less than four and a half here, since that's not quite up to that isoquant. Now let's double our inputs. So let's double our amount of labor to 30. Let's double our amount of capital to 20. And so now we'll be looking at this point right here. Now, again, just looking at the isoquants, it looks like it's on this dark gray one. I'm guessing that's this one for six and a half units of output. Rather than guess, let's plug the numbers in and see what happens. So Q equals 30 to the point two times 20 to the point four. Yeah, that's about six and a half, 6.543. So what just happened? We doubled our inputs, which means we doubled our costs. And what happened to our output? Oh, it less than doubled, less than doubled. Let's see how much our output went up. So if we just look at 6.543 divided by 4.317, 
we can get that multiple, and that multiple is about 1.5. So here in this example, our lambda is 2. We multiplied our inputs by 2, we doubled them, and then this phi is equal to 1.5-ish. So the fact that we increased our inputs more than we increased our outputs, that means we have decreasing returns to scale because lambda is greater than phi or phi. Now let's see what happens if we look at a different production function here. So in this example, we have q equals l to the 0.6 times k to the 0.4. And so again, we could pick any two points. Let's just uh, pick a simple example here. Let's say to start off, we had 10 and 10, 10 workers and 10 machines. And then we double both inputs to 20 and 20. If we look at our legend over here, 10 and 10, we're on this green ISO quant, which looks like it's for 10 units of output. And when we double both inputs, looks like we're on this purple one, and that's this one on the legend for 20. Now with this production function, this should be obvious if you think about the math here, right? Because if we plug in the same number here, 10 and 10, and they're to the 0.6 and the 0.4 here, then how do we simplify that? We add the exponents. 0.6 plus 0.4 is 1, 10 to the first power. And same thing, if we had 20 and 20, we're going to end up with 20 units of output. Okay, so what just happened? We doubled both inputs, and our output also exactly doubles. What do we call that? Right, we call that constant returns to scale. If the amount we're multiplying our inputs by is equal to the amount we're multiplying our outputs by, constant returns to scale. Now again, why that's important is, if we multiply our inputs by two, our total cost has to be also doubling. But if we double our cost and we double our output, then our cost per unit is going to remain the same, right? So here's all we're saying is average total cost or cost per unit is equal to total cost over quantity. If we have constant returns to scale, then we're multiplying the top and the bottom by the same amount and that's not going to change our cost per unit. But what about this example we had up here where we had decreasing returns to scale? Well, in this case, what we did is our cost per unit, again, it's calculated total cost divided by quantity, and call this cost per unit or average total cost. In this case, we multiplied our cost by two right, that's our lambda, but our output only went up by 1.5. What's going to happen to our cost per unit in this case? Well, the numerator of this fraction went up by more than the denominator, and so the average total cost, the cost per unit, is going to get higher as we try to expand our output in this case. That's what we mean when we say decreasing returns to scale. Really, that's why we care. As we try to expand output, cost per unit is going to get higher and higher. All right, let's look at this final example on this handout here. Here we have Q equals L to the 0.6 times K to the 0.6. All right, so let's pick two points again. Let's pick some simple ones, kind of like we did last time. It will work with any pair of points we want. 10 workers, 10 machines, and then we double to 20 and 20. If we just look at the legend, the red is at about 15, so we're a little more than 15 units of output there. And then up here, we're a little beyond 35. So if we're going from a little more than 15, maybe 16, to a little more than 35, it looks like we're going to have increasing returns to scale. It looks like our output's more than doubling, but let's double check. So right here, we're getting an output of almost 16, so 15.85. And then here, we're getting output of a little bigger than 36, 36.41. So in this example, 
our lambda, again, we multiplied our inputs by two, we doubled them. Our phi is 2.3, almost, not quite, but almost 2.3. So since our output went up by a larger multiple than our inputs, we have increasing returns to scale. So now that we understand the basic idea of returns to scale, let me show you a trick and why it works. You'll notice in this first production function, q equals l to the point 2 times k to the point 4, that those exponents are smaller than they are in the second example, 0.6 and 0.4, and these are a little smaller than our last example. So we can kind of see that decreasing constant or increasing returns to scale probably has something to do with those exponents, right? Let's show why this is the case. Let's look at this last one. So what's going to happen if instead of L, I substitute into this equation 2L? And then instead of k, I'm going to substitute 2k. Well, we're going to raise the 2l to the 0.6 and the 2k to the 0.6. We're going to distribute that exponent to the 2 and the k, the 2 and the l. And what we're going to end up with is 2 to the 0.6 times 2 to the 0.6 times l to the 0.6 times k to the 0.6. Or, 2 to the 1.2, l to the 0.6, k to the 0.6. This is going to be our new output after we multiply our inputs by 2. Well, what's 2 to the 1.2? Well, since that exponent is bigger than 1, 2 to the 1.2 has to be larger than 2. That's why this Cobb-Douglas production function has increasing returns to scale. Whatever number we're multiplying the inputs by, 2, 3, 4, or 5, is going to end up multiplying our output. Here's our original production function. Here's the same thing, but you can see what it's going to be multiplied by is going to be either 2 to a power bigger than 1, or 3 to a power bigger than 1, right? So increasing returns to scale is happening because the sum of these exponents is bigger than 1. So when we collect the 0.6 and the 0.6 and we add those exponents together, if we're going to get something larger than 1, we're going to have increasing returns to scale. In this example, the exponents add up to 1. So whatever number we multiply our inputs by, we're going to end up with q equals that number, 2, 3, or 4. Let's just say it's 2. When we collect those exponents, it's going to be to the 1, l to the 0.6, k to the 0.4. Since that's raised to the first power, output is going to be multiplied by exactly the same number that we multiplied our inputs by. Constant returns to scale. And then similarly here, because these exponents add up to something less than 1, we're going to have q equals 2 to the 0.6 here times our original production function. And 2 to the 0.6 is going to be less than 2, so we're going to have decreasing returns to scale or diseconomies of scale. Those two phrases mean exactly the same thing. So now we've shown the rule for a Cobb-Douglas production function and remember that a Cobb-Douglas production function is going to look like any constant times L to some exponent times K to some exponent. As long as A plus B, some of the exponents, is bigger than 1, we're going to have increasing returns to scale. If they're equal to 1, it's going to be constant. If they add up to less than 1, we're going to have decreasing returns to scale. In these examples, just to make it a little simpler, I set this constant equal to 1 so we didn't have to deal with it. But that constant isn't going to matter. It's really the sum of those two exponents that's going to determine whether you have increasing, decreasing, or constant returns to scale. Now, if you're dealing with any other kind of production function that isn't Cobb-Douglas, you're going to have to do a similar kind of procedure to figure out whether you have increasing, decreasing, or constant returns to scale. So for example, if somebody gave you just 
I'm making up a random production function here. Output was the square root of x plus y for any inputs x and y or l and k, whatever you want to call them. If you want to see what happens to output, then we'd have to substitute x for, say, 2x. If you wanted to do this in a little more fancy mathematical way, instead of putting the number 2, we could put phi in there, right? But let's just do it a little bit simpler. So the square root of 2x plus 2y. We want to see how this output's going to compare to this output. So we're going to have square root of 2 times the square root of x, just to kind of isolate that, plus 2y. We can see here that it looks like it's going to be decreasing returns to scale. We could plug in some numbers to verify this if we wanted. The y term is going to have sort of constant returns as we increase y. We double the amount of y, its contribution to output is going to be 2y. But the fact that we have the square root over on this case is going to mean that as we increase x or double x, the amount of output due to increasing x is going to only go up by the square root, which is going to be less than multiplying by 2, right? It's going to be multiplying by 1.41. So in this case, we can see that we'd have decreasing returns to scale with this function. So the rule that we're using for Cobb-Douglas you can't just extend blindly to other kinds of functions. We can't add up the exponents here, right, which is really this is x to the 0.5 and y to the 1. Adding those exponents isn't really going to tell us anything in this case. We have to do it a little more directly. So I encourage you to practice this a little bit. Make sure you understand. Practice plugging in values into different production functions with different exponents to verify so that you can trust this and you really understand what kind of Cobb-Douglas production functions will have increasing, decreasing, or constant returns to scale. So this is Dr. Berkey signing out. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. But otherwise, have a great day, and I wish you the best of luck in your studies.